you doing? Kick back. On this episode of the Warrior Woodshots, we're going to talk about table saw and table saw safety. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome to the Warrior Woodshop channel. This is where we're going to talk about table saws and table saw safety. I got Coach Niver with me and English teacher Miss Schmidt. Would you guys, you've used a saw before? Yes, sir, many times. What about you? No, should I leave? Should I even be here? You're, you're okay, you're okay. This, okay. we teach all levels of students because the table saw is on every project. Yeah, we have some projects we call garage projects, but then you're restricted to the boards you buy at Home Depot and Lowe's. And well, this, this is going to be able to make you stuff you want. I hear you're going to be on a, uh, another one of our shows or episodes. Yes, I'm going to make a farmhouse table for Coach Freeman. I've already built one for Coach Tinker and for Coach McKinney. I can't wait to film that one. It's going to be all you, but it's going to be a cool project. Jason, so this is awesome saw. I'm glad I had able to use it, but this wouldn't fit in my garage. Fortunately, table saws come in three different sizes. This is what we call the cabinet style. It's typically in a cabinet shop, big workshops. It's got its name because it's sitting on a cabinet. The one that you might want for your garage is what's called a contractor saw, which has got a stand, a little bit smaller, motor's a little smaller, but still powerful enough to do most furniture projects and portable enough for guys like you and me that have garages and not a big workshop. The last one is what they call benchtop saw. So it's designed to set on the bench, hobbyists, beginners. So which one do you think you guys would get if you were at home? What would you get? I would get the construction saw. Space? Yep. You're a beginner? I'm a beginner, I'd get the last one probably. The, the little bench top? Yeah. If someone's gonna get hurt on the table saw, it's usually because of the way they were operating. It's, it's a lot of times it's operator error. We do have a special feature with this saw to, to make the kids a little, feel a little more comfortable. It's called a saw stop. It sends an electrical current through the blade, so if you were to accidentally contact it, it's going to stop the blade immediately, reducing maybe a scratch, maybe stitches. The injury is going to be minor. I could see uh, kids daring another kid to go ahead and see if they can trip it. We are going to make anybody that trips the saw replace the parts that were damaged. Unfortunately, the way this works out is the the cartridge eats into the blade, so the blade's destroyed and so is the cartridge. If a kid is dared to do it, there's gonna be some discipline. When it comes to tripping the saw stop cartridge, regardless of the reason, accident or intentional, we're gonna ask a family to reimburse the shop department for the $100 that has to be spent because we cannot reuse an expanded or expended cartridge. It also damages the blade because it digs into to it and damages some of the teeth. So there is the justification for the $100 reimbursement cost. If it's intentional, if it's a dare, if it's a challenge, it's not even a debate. There's going to be discipline added onto that. I mean, we've told the kids, don't do that. You're still going to get one knucklehead. Not a debate. The debate is, what if it's truly an accident? That one student that it did happen to a few years ago was an accident. That parent was relieved to get the call that their son was on his way to class rather than the emergency room via an ambulance. The $100 fee sucked, but it's still cheaper than co-pays. It's still cheaper than being in a hospital overnight or stitches or missing sports practices, family events. All that stuff adds up all because of a momentary lapse of judgment on the table saw. So the decision's been made by our department, it's backed by our administration, whether you agree with it or not, regardless of the reason, we're gonna ask the family and the student to reimburse us for the $100 of the cost to replace the cartridge and buy a new blade. All right, to be able to use the table saw, you gotta understand the parts. So let's start off with the basics. Okay, you have some sort of guard system, and we'll go over that here in a second, but this red zone is called the table insert. 
and obviously you've got you got your blade on the guard system this is what's called an overarm guard it's an ex, it's an add-on but on a typical blade guard system is you're going to have some sort of shield that protects your fingers well let me rephrase that tells you where you shouldn't put your fingers this guard is like caution tape on a hole it's not going to keep you from falling in it but it tells you where you shouldn't go the back part of the guard system is what's called a splitter. It's kind of like a median on the, the concrete median on the interstate. It's supposed to keep the blade from crossing the center line, which is a big contributor to kickback. The last thing is called kickback fingers or kickback, kickback uh, dampener. Ours has a dampener because it keeps it, if it does come up, it reduces the intensity of it. All right, the next thing we have to do is know how to set the blade height and the blade angle. Now, most of the time, the angle straight up and down. That's what you're going to do most cuts. But, hey, there are some projects you're going to want an angle. But there's two wheels on the table saw, one on the front, one on the side. Ms. Schmidt, what do you think the wheel on the front might do? Well, this one has the numbers, which I guess would indicate angles. So I think this one would change the angle. That sounds like common sense, but it's actually the complete opposite. It's the way the mechanics work inside the table saw. It's one of those things you don't have to understand. You just got to. So the phrase we teach the kids in class is the wheel up front raises it up. The wheel on the side tilts it to the side. I've actually had kids. I, I walk over to the saw and I hear them reciting that. Hey, whatever works. Eventually it'll come second nature to you. This is most table saws. There are going to be some little, like you mentioned, the contractor saw. I've seen wheels inside of wheels. I've seen two wheels on the front. Again, consult your manual. I know, reading a book. English teachers, that's what they do, right? Always. <laughs> so let's go over how high to set the blade. So I'm going to have you practice that if you don't. Go ahead and set the board next to the blade. Actually, no, let's go. Right, let's do this. Right yep. up against yep. it. Now come over here in the front. Okay. And go ahead and crank the wheel. Now, how high do you think we should set that? Let's. Um, probably to. I'd say maybe. Here. Your. Uh, it would work, but imagine if we didn't have the saw stop and something happened. Your fingers are going to go right clear into chicken nuggets, so to speak. That's why they call them chicken fingers, I guess. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so we want just the tooth above the blade. So go ahead and lower it down. So uh, right about there. there. There you go. Awesome. So on a non-saw stop table saw, if something was to go wrong, you're still going to get hurt. But the intensity. You know, now, what happens a lot in our classes, remember I said that kids get the wheels confused, they'll come over here and rotate this one, one rotation, and realize, oh, wrong wheel, and then move over here. What didn't I do? Didn't correct it back. Do You're you, not going to get a 90 degree cut. Can you tell that that's 89 degrees? No. no. And you're even looking at it, and you're trying, you know it's, it's, so coach, you put a few projects together, when do you think they're going to notice this 89 degree cut? They're not going to notice it until they try to assemble it and they have a gap. Which in our class could be weeks later because we only get an hour or two at a time. So you've ruined the piece of wood. So what do you think I want the kids to do? What, what would you, if somebody else used this before, what should you check? You should check it and make sure you reset it back to zero, right? Yep. So awesome. it doesn't take much, does it? Oh, yep, it's at zero because that prevents some headaches. The next thing we have to, there's a couple different kinds of cuts on the table saw that you can make. Actually, there's three. There's rip cuts, which is going with the grain. There's cross cuts, which means they're going across the grain. And the last kind is really the most dangerous. They're channel cuts where the blade only cuts part way through. Never cut freehand on a table saw. Do not use the miter gauge and rip fence at the same time unless you have a spacer block attached to the back of the fence. What we're going to do in our class is mostly rip cutting. There's a reason we don't want kids doing the cross cuts and it's time, safety, just easy tying up the saw. So to set up a rip cut, you're going to use this thing called a rip fence here. Now you notice anything? How would I know how big to set this? What do you notice? Well, it looks like there's some measurements on the side here. 
And it depends on how the saw is set up, is how well you can rely on that. And I'd say it's within a sixteenth of being accurate. And from your experiences, what would you say? Well, if you're cutting sides of a box or whatever, as long as they're the same, so you cut them all at the same time, the exact measurement doesn't matter. So, yeah, a bookshelf can be 29 and 15 sixteenths or 30, you're not going to notice. But if I need to fit an exact piece that I measured at my workbench with a tape measure, I'm going to come right up here and double check it with my same tape measure for that absolute accuracy. Again, that's just into more of the fine woodworking, but that's the, the difference between a kid making district and making state in our woodworking class competition. All right. So now that we got the blade height set and we've got our fence set, when you lock it, make sure you just, you know, you don't need a romp on it, but you want to make sure it's where it's supposed to be. We got to talk about the danger zone. Obviously the guard is going to give you a visual margin of safety is what we call it in class. This red zone, we set the table insert, that gives you a couple inches on each side, but our rule is three inches. The problem is when we're cutting, that red zone disappears because the board's hiding all of it. So what I like to tell the kids is use these miter tracks because they're about four inches on most sides. Some are three, but most are about four inches away. So that gives you a visual kind of place. So that's for most cuts. So what happens when you get too close? So you mean a cut like this? Yes. That's where the manufacturer sends these handy dandy little things called a push stick. What's your opinion? Mr. Right away, I, honestly, I would never use that or that. I mean, I'm a, I'm I got a, a good deal on that at the woodworking shop. <laughs> these, these, I'm an intermediate woodworker. I'm not an expert, but I will tell you, I have these at my own home shop. You get much more control over the board, and personally, I just feel safer with it. Here, could you just try to try to push the board forward. And what if I lift it here? Oh, Do you have any gosh. way to stop it? No. Okay, let's let's try that again with that one. Just see, I'm I'm actually yeah. lifting harder than I did the first time. Huh? So why wouldn't you just use this one all the time, no matter if you're in the danger zone or not? Actually, your hands, that's a very good question. Your hands are the best thing you can control a board because you really lose your sense of feel. Wow. So in our class, our woodworking class, it's a good rule to follow. There's, we have a measurement rule. Under three inches, so you, basically if you can't see the track, yes, you're going to use it no matter what. Okay. Over six, that's where we want your hands to control it because it's definitely safer. So that gray zone is probably where you two might differ. That three to six, I don't want to make a kid too nervous. I don't want to make a beginner too nervous. I try to get my students to go be about four before they grab a push stick. Because again, the more you have more control with your hand, but there's just a point where it starts to get too dangerous. That was a very good question. Thanks for asking. You want to inspect your material because if you don't have a straight edge to guide along this fence, you're going to have a hard time keeping the board straight and tight. The other thing that you want to check for is items in the board, like nails, staples, even knots. But knots, if they're not tight, trivia. You know what causes knots? No, I don't. That's actually where a branch was on the tree. Oh. A little trivia there. Interesting. And if it's a solid branch, the knot is in there pretty tight, and you can cut through it. But if it was a twig, that knot might not be bound to it anymore and that thing come flying at you these blades are turning at 100 miles an hour and that little it's like you know putting that thing in a pitching machine and standing in front of it yeah. same thing could happen with nails and staples and you don't want a staple flying at you at 100 miles an hour yeah. and in our class that stable will cost the kid a hundred dollars so i think it's worth taking a few seconds to look over the board agreed Stance is one of the most important things on preventing kickback on the table saw. So only second to hand placement. I think they're probably equal. So we're gonna go over each one, but let's start with the stance. Okay. To keep kickback from happening, you've gotta keep the board against the fence. Okay. So a lot of people, if I stand right here, I'm right in the danger zone. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Right. So a lot of people like to stand right where you're at. Oh, awesome. So I want you to pretend cut here 
keep the board against the fence okay. and push forward at the same side, same time. All right. There we go. Okay. Okay, that's really awkward. You were safe. Yeah. But kind of awkward. Yeah, I was very awkward. I felt like I didn't really have a lot of control over. It. So let's. So again, we don't want to stand right in line with it. So where's the other place you think you might be able to stand? So would I just go ahead and stand on the other side of the blade? There you go. Awesome. Now, now let's do the same practice again. You can move a little closer. Pretend the blade's this line. Okay. So. That more. feels a lot better. Okay. The only thing that is equal importance with stance is where your hands were. And if you just recall, if we pretended this track was the blade, you had definitely had your hands in the wrong place. But yeah. we were focused on the stance. You got the stance down. Where your hands were on top is not the safest place because boards have sawdust on them. So what, what did I always tell you to do, Coach, when you're pushing a board through? Thumb behind here. And I always stand up here. This hand does not ever move. It just keeps it up there nice and tight against the fence. So from that quick demo, mm -hmm. a little trivia again, there's a little test. This is not trivia, this is a test. There's three directions we need you to push. So you need to push down. Down is one. Forward and two. to the side. Nailed it. Yes. Or yeah. cut it. <laughs> when rip cutting, Make sure your feed force or your push hand is between the blade and the fence. Your right hand is going to be doing the forward pushing for sure. Your left hand, definitely the sideways pushing. We try to encourage both hands, if possible, to do the downward. Now, coach uses his right hand to hold down. That's totally fine. I like to put knuckles on the table and put my thumb over the top. It's just a little bit of extra pressure, just reassurance. Okay, so let's demonstrate stance and hand place and see if we can get this all into one here. No, we're not running, saw's off. All right. And we're not really cutting here. So, so here and then. Now think about oh, stance. And there then you over go. Here. It's a little bit awkward, but not quite so as awkward as before. Knuckles on the table, and this hand never moves, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. this hand can be wherever you feel comfortable. Like I said, I've had kids put their palms, whatever's comfortable for you, with that okay. left hand. There you go. Now, how far do you think you want to push it? Um, you should push it until the board's all the way through the saw. Right? Okay, there you go. Keep going. Pass, pass the pass splitter. It. Awesome. Unfortunately, we had a student a few years ago that forgot about that, and the front half of the blade's going down, but the back half of the blade's coming up. And as soon as you cross that center line right here, the board becomes two pieces. He let go of the board. The back half was lifting up. It shot back, and... To add insult to, or misery to insult, or injury to insult, whatever the phrase I'm looking for here is, he was standing directly in line with the blade. So he got a midsection shot real hard, <laughs> real fast. And he had to sit down, let's put it that way. That's one of those you'll only do once. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Now, that works for a two foot board. What do you think of a really long board? How you I, have, I have you cut it. <laughs> That doesn't work at your house, though, does it? Yes, sir. With a long board, your hand stays cupped, and you push it forward. Now, when we're talking, uh, I'm not talking super long here. We're talking like four footers, where most of the board's hanging off the table. Mm -hmm. and once your hand reaches the table, you'll do a quick flip. If it is a super long board, eight footers, 12 footers, you are going to need extra person because you're going to be eight foot behind the saw. So then, my job will be to be the left hand while you're pushing it forward until you can come up and take over for yourself. Why do you think we're not worried about anything behind the saw? Because we got a table. We got a table. What do you have at your house? See, I don't have a table, so it is a problem on a longer board. It gets heavy. I have to get one of my sons out there. Okay. Person is better than nothing, but a sawhorse, a temporary table, something, because yeah, the Gravity. It's got to be the right height too. It can't be too low or it's going to tip on you anyway. It can't be too high because you'll get halfway through the saw and it'll stop. So setup, stance, hand placement. Those are the three things that really are going to protect you and keep you from getting kicked back. In the Warrior Wood Shop, 
The table saw is one of the tools that we require a setup check each and every time you're going to use the saw. So what you're to do is get the saw set up, call the instructor over, we'll verify your setup is correct, and say you're good to go. If it's not, we can make any adjustments necessary to prevent any potential risk of complications. So there's a couple last minute rules that we just need to go over that, that aren't too complicated. One is you're cutting, don't reach around, don't let go of the board, don't try to flick your scrap out of oh, the way. Jason, when, when I took over for you, you moved back over here. I was a sub. Yeah, he subbed a lot of my classes yeah. uh, so 10 I, years ago. Yeah, for, for six months, I subbed shop at Second. And I had a young man who was OC, obsessive compulsive. And he couldn't stand for that little piece of wood to be buzzing next to that saw. And he'd try to reach in and grab it. Fortunately, I had a stick, probably more like this size. When the kids used it, I wouldn't let them use it alone. And I got his hand away um, and warned him that if he ever did it again, he would never use the saw again. <laughs> but he couldn't stand that piece of wood sitting there. It made him crazy. Won't that piece kick back, though? There, it might vibrate around a little bit, but kickback happens because the board gets stuck here against the fence against the moving blade. Since there's nothing out here to have it stuck against, there's no boost, basically. So it'll vibrate. Don't stand in the way of it, but definitely. I've had four students get stitches in my 20 years, two of them on the table saw. Both of them because of that exact gesture. And they were both advanced students, second and third year. And I asked them, I said, you've done that before, haven't you? So, and both of their answers were yes. You can get away with breaking safety rules, but it will eventually come up to bite you. And it bites hard. <laughs> they're, they're not jokes. These aren't suggestions. They're definitely safety rules for a reason. So to turn the switch on, all you gotta do is pull. Okay. And if you ever get uncomfortable, that no, shuts it off. Okay. So, just to quickly go through it for you to review, we're going to lock our fence. Okay. I'm going to do this as a dry cut. Blade height, we've already set from before, so we don't have to review that one. So we'll put our guard down. Okay. My body stance is diagonal to the fence. I don't want to be flat-footed because if, if it starts to twist, mm -hmm. you can see how, you know, we, we always say, even though it's shop, it's still an athletic stand stance. So your left hand, whatever's comfortable, okay. and your right hand in the center of the board. In the center of the board. The reason we don't want to go, watch what happens if I push over here. Oh, See how it comes away yeah. from the fence? But if I push here in the center, it, it's, it's so, plus you have the left hand to back it up. So mm -hmm. there, there's your, and then follow through, and then reach down, or you can tap it with your knee, whatever's more convenient. All right, now that I've reviewed it, do you think you're ready? I guess so. Do you think I'm going to need this? Well, we're going to make a nine inch cut. So from the rules, the little, the little quiz, do you need it at nine inches? No, it's six and under, right? Six and under, we grab it. So go ahead and let's check our blade height. Go ahead and do that. So right. you flip the so guard up. Put this up. Still good. good. To go? Awesome. And students are going to find that common because most projects we use similar lumber. So let's go ahead and re okay. retract put the blade guard. Down. Okay, go ahead and set the fence to nine. All right, so we'll bring it over. The red line's on nine. Okay. Okay, so then my stance, I want to be angled. And then we'll flip this. Thumb over the edge, there you Thumb go. Thumb over the edge. Lock hand up here. Okay. All right, I will have my hand up here, but that's just, just in case. It is okay to slide forward with the feet. So far, so good. Everything's going to well. Awesome. I did this off camera and you did it real well. I reminded you off camera. Why didn't you lift up your left hand? Oh, because you need to stabilize yourself. So then that way, if you lose your footing, then you're not going to fall into the table saw. Yeah, we went over that one off camera, so that was a good, good unexpected uh, quiz there. Awesome job. Love it. Thank you. Don't you think you can handle a push stick cut for me? I believe I can. So let's set this to 
Let's go two and a half. Get out of the way. Two and a half. When I do it, I make sure my stop is right there. Sometimes this gets a little. Kids sit there and say they can't use the guard in this type of cut. There is plenty of room, plenty of room. to get that, that push stick through there. And for me, it just feels way more secure. I thought you were going to use the push stick. I did. Not the whole time. Don't need it the whole time. What only, we... only when I get, I wouldn't want to use the push stick with the board all the way back here. I'm going to get that. So I only need to use the push stick when I get into about six inches or so. And that just re reiterates the rule of you have more control with your hand, use it as much as you can. Most of the time in shop class, you will not be changing the blade. However, we want you to be aware at home your saw may require two wrenches or just one. Consult your manual or do your research to find out. If it only requires one, you will need a block to stabilize the blade while you loosen the arbor nut. Also be aware that some blades or some saws might be what's called left-handed threaded and they'll loosen the opposite way of righty-tighty. Well, there are a couple extra videos on how to cross cut with a table saw and one that involves kickback and how the saw stop works. And if you're in one of my woodworking classes or, or the other instructors, you probably are assigned to watch them anyways. So thanks for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell thing so you know when we post more videos. Thanks for watching. Go make some sawdust.